Hi there and good afternoon. My name is Ben Hush and I serve as the committee director for the National Conference of State Legislatures Standing Committee on Transportation. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's e-learning webinar on alternative vehicles and fuels and update on federal, private, and state efforts. While gasoline and diesel fuel are still far and away the number one source of fuel for vehicle transportation, the market is beginning to see the emergence of new alternative fuels including natural gas, ethanol, electricity, and other flex fuel vehicles. Today, we will hear from representatives from the federal government, private sector, and state government who will discuss the latest programs that are underway to develop and deploy alternatives to petroleum-derived motor fuels and vehicles that run on them, as well as what policies would be helpful in moving these vehicles forward. Before I introduce our first speaker, I just wanted to note as a reminder that we will hold a question and answer session after our three presentations. However, for those joining us via the web, please feel free, as the operator mentioned, to use the chat box in the lower right part of your screen to submit questions ahead of time. With that housekeeping note out of the way, let's jump right in. Our first speaker, Dennis Smith, is the director of the National Clean Cities Program, where he works closely with truck and auto manufacturers, fuel providers, state and regional governments, national laboratories, and other key stakeholders to expand the use of alternative fuels and other petroleum reduction technologies and practices in the transportation sector. He will provide an update and overview of the National Clean Cities Program and how it works to develop partnerships that help to support local decisions to adopt vehicle technologies and practices that contribute to petroleum reduction in the transportation sector and help to accelerate widespread usage of advanced technologies. With that, the floor is yours, Dennis. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, glad to be part of the webinar today. Yeah, the, the Clean Cities program uh, that my team uh, manages is part of the U.S. Department of Energy, and I'm located at our headquarters office in Washington, D.C. And really, it's a national uh, deployment program that I will explain uh, to try to get uh, people to actually use some of the new fuels and the new technologies that Ben just went through. But let me take a minute to give some background and uh, these slides are going to be available to you later. I'm not going to cover every single point on every one. Some of them are for reference if you'd like to uh, use the numbers and, and, and the data later. But really, as uh, has been mentioned, oil dependency is really an issue, and it's dominated by on-road vehicles. Really, transportation is responsible for about two-thirds of the petroleum that we use in, in the United States. Uh, and on-road vehicles are responsible for about 80% of the transportation usage. So uh, aside from, you know, rail and marine and other transportation. So really, I know everybody has heard that oil production peaked some time ago in the U.S. in the 1970s. And essentially, we're importing so much oil that we're essentially spending about a billion dollars a day just to import uh, oil and petroleum that we're uh, addicted to, that we're dependent on. So really, uh, the program that uh, we're part of at the Department of Energy is called the Vehicle Technologies Program. And it's primarily a research program. Probably 90% of the funding goes towards R&D programs for some of the new technologies, whether it's the, the hybrid and the electric vehicle systems, uh, which I think most people are, are hearing a lot about these days, but also uh, we continue to work with advanced combustion engines. I mean, there's still a lot of efficiency gains and improvements that can be done with uh, regular internal combustion engines. Uh, there's fuel technologies uh, with some of the new bio-based fuels uh, that can be used in, in some existing vehicles out there, or maybe some synthetic uh, blends to make the fuels and not have to use petroleum. There's material technologies that we deal with, uh, trying to make the the uh, things lighter weight in the vehicles so that they'll get better fuel economy, be lighter weight and also stronger at the same time. And then the area that we're going to focus on for most of the presentation is really the technology introduction area, we call it. In other words, all of the R&D work that's done, really, ultimately, that's not successful unless you actually get people to start using it later. So we have this portion of the program, it's about 10% of our total budget that goes towards uh, the, what I was calling deployment or these technology introduction activities. And really the national program is called Clean Cities. I think some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, we've got four major activities that we do as part of Clean Cities. Uh, one uh, is to develop what we call local Clean Cities coalitions and support 
building partnerships in communities out there. Really, you're not successful in implementing these things um, unless you can do it in the localities, in the local cities where they can really um, get the vehicles out there, work with the fleets, get the fueling stations out there. It's difficult for us at a national level to just implement a policy. We've got to get the, the local uh, feet on the ground to do this. So I'll show a map in a little bit where we've got these coalitions. But that's to form all the right partnerships and to really help the communities uh, get the information they need to um, help develop the infrastructure and so forth. And as part of that, the second tier of this is to provide a lot of public information, outreach, and education because there's a lot of misinformation about these new technologies and what they can do, what they can't do, what they should cost, what the benefits should be, or maybe what some of the challenges are. So we have a lot of information and tools that are available to help people decide what might be the best options for them. Then the third aspect is technical and problem-solving assistance. Uh, most all of these new technologies guess what, there's some hiccups involved with them when they first get out there. So we would like to work with uh, some of the early adopters and the first fleets that are using them to hear about where are the issues and uh, help get those things fixed and address them uh, early on so that as many people can have uh, successful, uh, good experiences with the technologies as they get out there. And then finally, the fourth uh, aspect, which most people is the first thing they ask about, is uh, we do provide some financial assistance from time to time in the form of, of grants or other type of cost share mechanisms to encourage um, private sector uh, partnerships or with state governments or with other groups to really get some of the projects done. And we, we deal with all of the above, so to speak, on the, uh, the different technologies. It's, it's not just uh, electric vehicles that are a lot of people are talking about, but also the other alternative fuels, uh, natural gas, propane, ethanol, biodiesel, um, and even hydrogen, and, and uh, also just some fuel economy strategies to help people go farther or drive smarter to reduce needless idling and things like that uh, in communities as well. So this is a map of where we've got these Clean Cities Coalitions. We've got nearly 100 of them designated around the country. It represents uh, close to 80% of the U.S. population. And you see them in, in, in most of the states. I think there's only three or four states where we don't have uh, coalitions that are active. And in each one of these areas, uh, we've got a core group of these partnerships in the local community where they've got uh, organizations that provide the fuel and are building the fueling stations. They've got vehicle providers that are looking at uh, how can I get the vehicles serviced and and uh, and support them in in there. The, the local communities and the local governments are supportive, and there's usually state policies in place that help uh, support uh, these uh, technologies as well. So there's a, a core group uh, that is really our affiliate there to try to do the hand-holding and help manage the projects and to get things done to help implement these alternative fuel uh, uh, programs and projects out there. And the nice thing about it is they, it's a networking program. So even though uh, maybe the people in one part of the country, it's new to uh, whatever they're trying is new, I can pretty much assure you there's another dot on the map where they've tried that things similarly before and they can share lessons learned with them. So it's a very successful program from that standpoint, just the networking. Uh, one of the aspects that we kicked off this past year is called the National Clean Fleet Partnership. Uh, President Obama announced it really a, a year ago, April, and that was to work with some of the large national fleets to really get them to be pace setters. Uh, some of the companies you see their logos there, the Coca-Cola, UPS, FedEx, AT&T, and, and others, they're operating thousands of vehicles out there. And so if they are utilizing these new technologies, I think that makes other fleets uh, set up and take notice. And they can also learn from them as far as what's worked well, what hasn't worked so well, uh, and uh, really try to follow that uh, example. And, and in many cases, the key is infrastructure, the refueling stations or the charging stations that, that you're going to need, 
and sometimes it doesn't make sense for to install that equipment for just a small number of vehicles, but if you can combine forces and have these fleets work together, then they can share these refueling stations and really get a, a lot more out of them that way. We also have a unique uh, relationship with the National Park Service, and we're helping to fund uh, demonstration projects in a number of the parks around the country where uh, people can go and see some of these vehicles actually in service every day at the parks, uh, not only doing their daily job, but I think helping to drive the message home that um, these technologies are cleaner, they help to preserve the environment and some of the national treasures of our uh, outdoor parks and, and uh, facilities there as well. So that's been kind of a unique high visibility partnership that even though it's with national parks, they're obviously located in states and, and there's been a good uh, interface with the communities there as well. We've got quite a few web resources where tools and information is available, either through directly from our Clean Cities website, or we've got um, information available on what we call our Alternative Fuel Data Center. Some of you may have used that where we've got tools and mapping services if you're going to drive across country and you need to know where are these refueling stations because you've got a flex fuel vehicle or you've got a natural gas vehicle, you need to know where can I buy fuel along the way. Uh, we've got mapping services in there, and in fact, what a lot of people don't realize is uh, Google and MapQuest and some of the other online uh, mapping services have that capability as well, and they're actually accessing our data uh, as far as the locations, and you can drill down, find out what you know when these places are open, what credit cards they take, and all of that. So you can plan your trip as effectively as you would with a, a gasoline or, or uh, conventional vehicle out there. And then fueleconomy.gov, some people are familiar with that when they shop for vehicles. There's every vehicle back to 1984 if you're trying to compare gas mileage or other aspects of a vehicle so you can get the most efficient one for either your personal use or for your fleet. And I've got individual slides here for each of these things I just mentioned, but I'm not going to spend too much time on them uh, so that we can provide plenty of time for the other speakers here and we can come back if you've got individual questions on, on some of the tools and and uh, what's available to you there. So that was just a slide on fueleconomy.gov. This is on the Alt Fuel Data Center. Uh, I mentioned the station locator. Uh, we've got also what's very important to people is uh, incentives and laws. They want to know if they want to if they buy one of these vehicles, are they eligible for rebates or special tax breaks, or maybe can I drive this vehicle in the HOV lane uh, because it has an, uses an alternative fuel. So. Uh, they, they can search for whatever state or locality that they're interested in and see what uh, el uh, incentives that they're eligible for there. In addition, we've got some cost calculators where you can try to determine for your driving situation and miles per day and all that sort of thing, uh, does it, which technology might make the most sense for you and save the most money over a period of time. Uh, we've also got quite a few... Uh, uh, video testimonials that's available in what we call Clean Cities TV. It's sort of a YouTube type uh, of channel where you can get information and uh, see success stories for people who have tried these uh, vehicles in their fleets. Uh, and we've also got a partnership with uh, PBS Television with the weekly television show called Motor Week where they've featured a lot of the success stories and, and those are all available on this uh, online uh, TV station. Then the technical problem-solving systems I mentioned earlier uh, is to try to help with unforeseen difficulties that might pop up out there. Uh, the financial assistance that most people usually ask about first, uh, under the Recovery Act, or what some people call the Stimulus Program, we awarded around $300 million. There were 25 different projects in states all over the country uh, that either helped pay uh, for building refueling stations for alternative fuels or help to uh, pay the incremental cost of some of the vehicles or help to uh, it get uh, some local uh, uh, sort of streamlining of codes and standards and things like that that were necessary to help implement these projects. Those were all funded under the uh, this the National Recovery Act. Currently, we're implementing projects under what we call an Electric Vehicle Community Readiness Planning uh, Grant. We had 16 projects that were $8.5 million across 24 states, 
and those were really focused directly on uh, streamlining the codes and standards and getting other things in place for specific to electric vehicles in communities that were really interested in, in sort of taking a lead there because although most people um, are calling us asking can we help pay for vehicles and, and, the, and the refueling charging stations, um, those things can't be successful if you don't take care of all the, the behind the scenes matters and in many cases uh, those have to be done first before you can even think about installing the, the first piece of equipment. So we're uh, really hopeful that uh, some real lessons will be learned with these initial projects that we, so that we can fill in the rest of the map there uh, and uh, share what has been implemented in these initial cities. Uh, this slide here just uh, shows the website that you could go to for future financial opportunities and solicitations that we might offer. Typically, um, anything that, that we provide in the, as far as a funding opportunity is open to everyone out there. It, it's competitive, um, but in many cases we strongly encourage them to team up with uh, local and state governments uh, and to form groups like that so that uh, you really get a lot of bang for the buck, and you're you're having these uh, different entities that can learn from each other and replicate their successes across the country. So that's uh, uh, my presentation. That's uh, my direct contact information. And at the end, the, we'll be happy to answer questions about the funding opportunities or anything else that you guys would be interested in. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, that was really helpful. Uh, sounds like you guys uh, really have your hands full over there. Uh, our second speaker, Becky Harsh, who serves as the Director of Retail Consumer Policy at the Edison Electric Institute, the Association of U.S. Shareholder-Owned Electric Companies, and more commonly referred to as EEI. Uh, she leads EEI's internal and external consumer initiatives related to energy efficiency and energy and efficiency solutions and works to identify the impacts on utilities of major policy, technology, and consumer changes. Additionally, Becky leads EEI's efforts in advocating for research and development, incentives, and deployment of electric vehicles and infrastructure. With that, the floor is yours, Becky. Thanks, Ben, um, and thank you all very much, NCSL um, and Ben. You and Jamie, thank you so much for uh, including us in this discussion. We're very excited to have this opportunity. Um, so. I think today you just heard a really great presentation from Dennis about the variety of resources that are available through the Clean Cities program. And if you haven't had an opportunity to check out um, all of their amazing tools, I, I really do encourage you to do so. There is the, just a vast amount of great information there um, on all different topics. So it's always a really great place to start. Um, my presentation today, I'm going to focus more on one particular fuel type, that of electricity. Um, and more importantly, the role of electricity as a transportation fuel. Um, just real quick, want to get this out of the way, uh, Edison Electric Institute has been mentioned. We're the association of U.S. shareholder-owned electric companies. Um, the, the chart on the right side of the slide, that, that kind of gives you a breakdown of all the different customer groups that are um, served in, and by which section of the um, energy provider group. So uh, EEI, our companies make up about 70% of the U.S. electric um, power industry. Um, um, here's just, just wanted to kind of share with you guys a quick map. These are all of our different members in all, in all the different territories. So, um, you know, as utilities, I think we're very used to providing power to any number of things, so TVs, computers, appliances, that, that kind of thing. But I'm not sure that many of our companies were prepared to be the next gas station. Um, and, and yet here we are. Uh, this is a new issue for many of our utility companies. Um, it's a bit of uncharted territory, but we provide electricity to power any other, any number of things, so why not vehicles? Um, but it's not just new to us. I think that the role of um, transportation fuel provider, um, I think it's new to a lot of our regulators, and I think it's probably new to many of you as well. Um, and so we're all trying to work through what our role is, specifically as utilities, and how we fit into this market. Um, and we also, I, I don't want to ignore the many of, of those of who have been around this issue for a really long time. 15, 20 years ago, 
Um, there was another huge push for this technology. Um, and so people are wondering kind of why, you know, what's a different this time? Um, you know, why, why, should we, why should we believe the hype this time on electric vehicles? Um, so, but the, the truth of the matter is that there are a lot of things that have changed. This is a completely different time, new challenges. Um, there are international implications related to energy security, new pressures on reducing carbon emissions. Um, and there's a lot of new and better technologies out there. Um, so the opportunities for this kind of a transformational market um, are growing at an amazing speed. Um, so, and you know, while it's still evolving, I, I don't think anyone has any doubts that it's definitely here to stay. Today I thought I would provide you all with a quick overview of kind of the state of the market for electric vehicles um, and talk about why this is a good thing. Um, from a societal perspective, and then also some of the things that utilities are doing in preparation, um, and that would include some of the policy issues that um, are, in, are continuing to develop in the space that are going to impact this market. Electricity is, is it's already been funded, or excuse me, fueling any number of transportation applications. Um, anything from seaports to loading docks, uh, technology on airport runways, electric forklifts in warehouses and manufacturing plants, uh, mining applications, all are, are current examples of long established and widely available uses of electricity as a fuel. And now with recent improvements in innovative automotive technology, including advances in battery technology, drivetrain improvements, light weighting of materials, um, we're seeing a whole new generation of light-duty passenger plug-in electric vehicles as well. And we're seeing that that market is growing at a tremendous pace. Um, here's the latest information on who has or is planning to roll out either uh, an extended range electric vehicle, an all-electric vehicle, um, So, and I'm just calling those for ease of, of this discussion, plug-in electric vehicles. Um, and as you can see by this chart, it includes nearly every major auto manufacturer and some you've maybe not even heard of. Um, just a couple of quick statistics. Uh, the number of PEVs sold in the first six months of, two, of 2012 is nearly the same amount that were sold in the entire year of 2011 when these cars were first rolled out. Uh, early estimates are that the 2012 sales are expected to roughly triple those of the um, 2011 numbers. Um, also, the number of PEV models available has tripled since the rollout of the first PEVs um, in late 2010. Um, we started with the Nissan Leaf, the Chevrolet Volt, and the Tesla Roadster. Um, now there are probably more than a dozen different vehicles that are going to be hitting the market, commercially available um, vehicles that are going to be hitting the market by the end of 2012. Um, I, I did think this was interesting as well, that the number of PEVs sold just in the first 18 months of their availability has outsold the number of hybrids that were sold during the entire first 24 months of their, of their availability. So that, that gives you a sense of, of where this market is heading and how fast it's actually growing. But, you know, that is all great news, and, and we care about that a lot, but, you know, more importantly, what are... What are the benefits that this technology can bring to us? So let's, again, I'm going to kind of quickly go over some of the points that Dennis made, um, starting with most of the, in the obvious area of energy security. Um, as Dennis mentioned, you know, oil consumption in this country far exceeds anything we can produce ourselves. So we have to rely on foreign imports, and some of that tends to come from unstable or unfriendly countries, um, which creates a significant energy security risk. Um, I think it was 80% of that oil is being dedicated to the transportation sector. So we believe that it's critical that alternative fuel vehicles become a much bigger part of, of the mix. Um, ec economic development is another one. Um, investing money and resources into these types of domestically produced transportation fuels, like electricity, uh, effectively can inject billions of dollars back into our economy instead of sending it overseas. Um, also, there is the opportunity to open the door to a variety of new um, economic opportunities and job 
creation through new vehicle production, um, new technologies, diesel fuel conversion applications, battery and component manufacturing, um, the charging stations themselves, and any additional infrastructure um, that might be needed there. Um, and also the environmental, the environmental benefits, um, there has been increasing pressure to reduce emissions. Um, and electrifying the transportation sector uh, would really go a long way to help that. Uh, most of these vehicles have no emissions. Uh, the full battery electric, electric vehicles have no tailpipe emissions to speak of. Um, and, but the impacts of gas emissions, those are, you know, everybody understands those. They're well established. And there's not a whole lot of chance for that to get any cleaner. Um, electricity generation, on the other hand, has gotten much cleaner over the last few decades largely due to new and better technologies at the generation level, um, but also from a more diverse and cleaner portfolio of fuels um, to, to choose from. But beyond these types of direct um, societal benefits, you know, the value of electricity as a fuel is a good one. Uh, the cost of electricity to fuel a vehicle is the equivalent of about a dollar a gallon of gasoline. So even when, I think a few weeks ago, we saw uh, gas prices on a bit of a decline, I mean, we're still, that's a significant savings from a dollar to even three dollars uh, for a gallon of gas. Um, electricity is domestically produced. Uh, it, it, that supports our energy independence. There is an abundant and diverse supply, as I mentioned. It comes from a lot of different, um, a, a larger number of portfolios to make up that fuel mix. Um, and probably most importantly, the delivery system is already here. It already exists, and it's as close as your nearest outlet in your room. Um, I, I really do want to share this with you. This is a this is a slide we use um, quite a quite a bit around here. Um, it it really does a good job of showing the volatile nature and the unpredictability of the price of gasoline. Um, I'm going to try to use my pointer here just to show you guys. I mean, any number of uh, U.S. based Iraq, I mean, any number of things can really significantly impact the cost of, of gas prices. Unlike this blue line down here, you'll see that um, no matter what the crisis du jour, that the price of electricity remains fairly stable. So I thought I would touch really quickly on what some utilities are doing um, to work on promoting pu uh, public, or excuse me, um, what utilities are doing to kind of help do their part to move this market forward. Um, and largely I've broken this down into six areas for you. So we've got investment in charging in infrastructure. Um, and this is not necessarily the utilities themselves being in the charging business, but it's more collaboration with state and local officials, uh, public-private entities to help develop a charging infrastructure that makes sense for a specific community. Um, they, uh, utilities have been very involved in testing, installing public charging stations, um, some of them at their own facilities, uh, and then also working with governments and private sector to help make sure that those charging stations are installed properly. Um, incorporating uh, PEVs into our own fleets, largely utility fleets aren't made up of a lot of the lighter duty passenger vehicles, but where it does make sense, we are making that commitment to try to convert some of our fleets. Uh, we're also working with automakers to test and uh, validate vehicle performance on prototypes of new vehicle applications, especially in the utility field, and you're talking about hybrid bucket trucks, so that they may run on um, gas to a certain location, but you're able to turn that off and move to electric, for, and it provides a much quieter operation. Um, supporting customer uh, installations. These are things like providing various rate options to customers that will help uh, encourage customers to charge during off-peak hours. Um, we're hoping that you know by providing those a lot of different options in this regard, uh, we, we're hoping to drive some adoption of these new vehicles. Exploring opportunities to reduce costs, uh, the complexity, how long it takes when you're trying to put in charging infrastructure, um, and then also working with a lot of the local um, inspectors and permitting companies on how to streamline that process to make it much easier uh, for customers to get those 
charging stations put in their home. Um, on the outreach and education side, uh, working a lot with you know any type of uh, PEV related conference, auto shows, different types of events, um, updating within our own utilities, we're updating our call center training to incorporate electric drive vehicle knowledge and issues so that when our customers do have questions that our representatives are able to answer those. Uh, we're also doing a lot on developing websites uh, to provide customers with a lot of the latest information and education on, on this type of technology. Um, just a couple of uh, customer or even employee incentives. Here at EEI, actually our president, Tom Kuhn, put an incentive in place where um, if an employee here at EEI wants to purchase or lease an electric vehicle, um, they'll receive a $1,000 incentive for that. So he is, we, Tom Kuhn is very committed to moving this market forward. Um, also developing some consumer um, incentive programs, uh, as I mentioned, electric rate incentives, um, rebates on home chargers, uh, and as well as helping customers get access to some of the um, easier access to the charging stations if they want to install those within their own home. Um, just a couple of quick examples of some of the collaborative projects we've been working on. We've done a lot of work, uh, our companies have done a lot of work with uh, the Clean Cities Coalition, as, as Dennis mentioned. Um, a couple of others, we've got the California PEV Collaborative, um, the EV Project in ChargePoint America, um, doing some research and development, working with groups like EPRI, but we're also working with automakers, GM, Nissan, Ford, um, and talking through what some of the bigger issues are that we need to be addressing as the fuel provider. I wanted to share this with you all as a resource that we've put together. Um, this is our utility guide to readiness. Um, and basically, we broke this into a variety of different topics, but it has some great examples of um, specific utilities and what they're doing to get their territory ready. So it's how are they setting up the internal structure of the utility and getting organized uh, to be ready for the, the PEVs coming to market. It's a, a lot of different examples of customer education, be it websites, be it um, town hall meetings, sharing some of that information, getting out in the community, those kinds of things. Again, more information on some of the shareholder collaborators that they're working on, or excuse me, sh uh, stakeholder collaborators. What are we doing with the infrastructure? How are we making sure that we're getting our grid ready at the local, um, at the local level as well as any other types of um, overall improvements we need to make? So um, you can get a copy of the guide. I just put the uh, general EEI website, but you should be able to find it on, that, on the first page of our website. Um, if you have any problems, you can let me know. I'd be happy to get that for you. So while we're doing a lot working internally and working with um, local collaboration, um, we're also looking at opportunities that are promoting positive policies uh, that will help move this market forward. We firmly believe that state policy is going to be the game changer on this. Um, as everyone knows, we're not seeing that much going on at the federal level, um, and no one has uh, any indication that this is, that's going to change anytime soon. But we are seeing a lot more activity at the state legislative level, um, uh, not as much at the regulatory level and within the state commissions, um, but we do believe that we need to have both of those groups um, acting together, kind of trying to complement each other as they work through these issues. Um, this is a here's an example I thought I would share with you guys. These are some of the top legislative issues that. Um, we are focusing on, um, just quickly, uh, defining kind of the status of the third party service provider. These are largely the charging infrastructure providers. So should they be considered a regulated utility uh, for purposes of providing electricity to customers? Um, is this a, a sale or a resale of electricity issue? So we're taking a close look at that. Um, what is the role of the utility in the charging business? Um, our position is we don't want to preclude utilities if they are interested and it makes sense for their existing bo uh, business model, but um, generally uh, the consensus at this point is that not many of our companies are that interested in owning and operating charging stations, but more willing to provide the support 
any expertise as those uh, charging stations are, are put into communities. Road tax is another really interesting issue. It's um, given that that's currently included in the cost of gasoline, there's a lot of questions on should there be an electricity tax, um, and if so, how should that be um, figured out? Is it miles traveled? Also, who should be responsible for collecting that? Should it be something that's put on the utility bill? Um, our members are largely trying to move away from that and to try to find some new and different options for how that issue should, should be addressed. I would say this, that um, until we have a larger number of cars on the road, um, we're not seeing this as come up as often, but we know that it will be very soon as this market continues to grow. Uh, early notification efforts. Um, this is providing utilities access to who has bought the vehicles in any kind of given area. The purpose of this is for our um, planning purposes, infrastructure planning, um, uh, any type of distribution upgrades that might be necessary. Um, so it's important that we know where these cars are coming. If they're clustering in a certain area, we may need to go and take a look at the, um, at the distribution system in that area. So it's very important that we get that information early. And then finally, I'd say encouraging state collaboration and advisory councils on this um, to pull together as many stakeholders as possible and talk about you know, what these issues mean for not only the state or the city or the community, but also who are the players that need to be part of that conversation, um, what are the utility impacts to, the, to that community as well. So I would suggest that um, there are some things that NCSL members could do to really help move this forward. Uh, we would ask that if, to please support those policies that do encourage adoption of alternative fuel technologies, and this is both um, electricity and natural gas. We are of the mind that there is no one silver bullet on this and that there's got to be a lot of different fuels um, and a lot of different opportunities for different applications uh, that are going to meet everyone's lifestyle. Um, get involved uh, and get educated if you're not already. Uh, learn as much as you can about the latest technology and who's offering what, um, and then familiarize yourself with what the policy issues that are being addressed and what decisions are happening in which state. Collaboration, I cannot stress this enough, um, it, which is to my last point, and engaging with your local utility, but also any other stakeholders in this space from the auto manufacturers to the um, electric vehicle service provider group. Um, it's, as this market develops, the best tool we have is just collaboration, education, and conversation um, as to how we can all work together to best move this forward. So I think that that was my last slide. Um, so thank you very much. And I guess Ben, or, or Jamie, I'm sorry, I, I turn this over to you. Well, actually, I'd like to jump in real quick. Uh, thank you so much, Becky. Uh, that was really informative. Uh, seems like there's a ton going on with electric vehicles and really uh, a ton more to come. Um, but our third speaker, as Becky just mentioned, Jamie Rawl, uh, who is a senior policy specialist in the transportation program at the National Conference of State Legislatures. In addition to transportation funding, Jamie's other research and publications have addressed special transit, public-private partnerships, rail, aviation, transportation technologies, and many other issues. She also co-staffs uh, the NCSL Standing Committee on Transportation, which is made up of state legislators and state legislative staff from across the country. Jamie is going to explore, as uh, Becky just briefly mentioned, some of the activity going on at the state level. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, Jamie. Thank you very much. And I co-staff that committee with Ben. So Ben, thank you for including me today and for being a great person to work with on the committee. I'd also like to say hi to all the folks who are on this webinar today who I see who are Transportation Committee members. Um, so far today, our focus has really been on the environmental and energy benefits of alternative fuels and on federal and private actions to facilitate this emerging market. And certainly states also are interested and are aggressively pursuing and incentivizing alternative fuels. Having said that, uh, growing use of alternative fuels present both opportunities 
that we've talked about, but also challenges to a transportation funding system that relies so heavily on taxes in gasoline and diesel. The federal government and all 50 states tax motor fuels, including gasoline and diesel, and these taxes provide close to 40% of state revenues for highways, and they're the largest single source of funds used for highway purposes by about half the states. Motor fuel taxes also represent a whopping 92% of gross federal highway trust fund receipts. So my role here today is to talk briefly about the challenges that alternative fuels present to transportation funding and what states are doing to address these. The comments that I'm going to make today have to be understood within the context of a well-documented worsening nationwide transportation funding crisis, which many states have addressed in their legislatures in recent years in various ways. Studies have revealed a chronic structural gap between transportation infrastructure needs and current revenues at all levels of government. We see here some of the causes of that, including years of underinvestment, aging infrastructure, growing transportation demand, a still uncertain federal program, despite the recent 27-month authorization of surface transportation programs, the ongoing effects of the national recession that states are still catching up with, state budget shortfalls, and most importantly for this conversation, declining gas tax revenues and a political reluctance to raise gas taxes. As a result of all of these issues, at least 20 states have cut their overall transportation program since fiscal year 2010, and as of this last May, highway and road investments were below pre-recession levels in 28 states. Why are fuel tax revenues falling? Perhaps the largest reason is that most states assess fixed rate taxes, which assess the same tax based on cents per gallon, the same cents are charged per gallon of fuel year after year, despite inflation and growing construction costs. This depressing little graph here shows that the purchasing power of the federal gas tax has dropped by 33% since it was last raised in 1993. In addition, 14 states have not raised their gasoline taxes in more than 20 years. And so after adjusting to account for growth in construction costs, the average state's gas tax has effectively fallen by 20% since it was last increased. In total, state gas taxes have fallen by a combined $10 billion each year. Growing fuel efficiency in alternative fuel vehicles also presents some additional challenges to a system that relies so heavily on the taxation of fuels. A May 2012 Congressional Budget Office brief, for example, estimated that the proposed corporate average fuel economy or CAFE standards will result in a 21% drop in, drop in federal gas tax revenues by 2040. So what are states doing to address these implications? Certainly many states are aggressively incentivizing alternative fuels, again, for those advantages in terms of energy security and environmental goals. At least eight states provide a tax exemption or deduction for alternative fuels, and as of last year, at least 15 states and the District of Columbia offered monetary incentives for electric vehicles such as tax exemptions or credits and reduced registration fees for such vehicles. States are also looking, however, to address the funding sustainability issues through taxation of alternative fuels, fees on alternative fuel vehicles, studies and commissions to look at this issue, and vehicle miles traveled or VMT fees. This map shows that 27 states now impose a tax on some form of alternative fuel. By assessing fees or taxes on alternative fuels, this can help ensure that all users of the transportation system, even those who don't use traditional motor fuels, continue to pay to some degree for its upkeep. The alternative fuels that are taxed here include ethanol, natural gas, propane, hydrogen, electricity, or biodiesel. And of these 27 states that assess some form of tax on alternative fuels, 23 dedicate some or all of those revenues to transportation purposes. I should note here that although most states that tax alternative fuels do so at a reduced rate, at least nine, Idaho, Kansas, Louisiana, Maine, Minnesota, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, and Virginia tax some or all alternative fuels at an equivalent rate to gasoline or diesel. 
This map also shows that in nine states, operators of vehicles powered by certain alternative fuels must pay an annual flat rate fee instead of a tax on the fuel, for example, by purchasing an annual permit or decal. In some states, operators of certain vehicles have the option to pay either the annual fee or a tax on the fuel. Another option that some states have pursued is special registration or licensing fees for alternative fuel vehicles. The legislatures in Nebraska, Virginia, and Washington recently enacted such fees. Nebraska has assessed an annual $75 alternative fuels fee on alternative fuel vehicles. And that's a vehicle fueled by electricity or any other energy source not subject to existing fuel taxes. In Virginia, electric vehicles are now paying an annual $50 license tax. And in Washington, starting next year, operators of electric vehicles will be charged a $100 fee at the time of annual registration renewal on top of any other required fees or taxes. This fee will expire when the legislature imposes a vehicle miles traveled fee or tax, which I'll be talking about in just a moment. In all three states, the new revenues from these fees are to be used for highway maintenance and operations. State legislatures are also exploring concerns about the effects of alternative fuel and other vehicles on transportation funding by initiating studies and commissions. In 2012, for example, New Hampshire established a commission to study the taxation of alternative fuel and electric vehicles for the purpose of funding improvements to the state's highways and bridges. Kansas just launched a broader study of the long-term feasibility of relying on the gas tax as the primary mechanism for state and local transportation funding. In recent years, a growing number of transportation stakeholders have noted the potential of this next option, of augmenting and eventually replacing fuel taxes with fees that are based directly on the number of miles motorists drive, known as vehicle miles traveled or VMT fees. And the transportation stakeholders on the webinar will know that these are also called many other things, including mileage-based user fees or MBUF, mileage charges, many other names. A fee like this would charge users by the mile rather than by the gallon and could be collected by something as simple as annual odometer readings or something as sophisticated as advanced technologies that incorporate GPS and wireless communications. By charging users by the mile rather than by the gallon, VMT fees have the potential to unlink transportation revenues from petroleum motor fuel consumption and that can sidestep the challenges to funding sustainability now posed by the growing use of alternative fuels, as well as by the fuel efficiency improvements I mentioned earlier. No jurisdiction in the world now levies BMT fees on all vehicles, but many states have strong interest in this and are actively exploring the option. This map here shows that at least 18 states have now completed or undertaken BMT pilot projects. The map also shows that four states, Kentucky, New Mexico, New York, and Oregon, also now assess a kind of VMT fee for heavy vehicles in the form of taxes that are based both on miles traveled and vehicle weight. Legislatures have been looking at VMT fees in different ways, and since 2008, at least 11 states have considered 20 legislative measures that propose to establish or study state-level VMT fees. Having said that, of those, only one has been enacted and that's Washington's House Bill 2190 from this year, which funds a study of the operational feasibility of a road user assessment and pending subsequent appropriations would authorize a limited pilot project on a VMT system for electric vehicles specifically. Other categories include VMT fees for electric vehicles or hybrids specifically, establishing VMT pilot projects or studies, and Oregon considered legislation to establish a statewide VMT framework, uh, and that grew largely out of a, a very well-known pilot project that that state completed. VMT fees offer potential benefits, including sensitive and flexible pricing, keeping fees connected to people's use of transportation infrastructure, and the use of proven technologies. They also have the potential to either replace motor fuel taxes for all vehicles or just to supplement existing revenues. 
as it shows here, some states have considered VMT fees for electric vehicles only, which could address the funding sustainability issues related to the growing use of alternative fuel vehicles without requiring a system-wide transition from fuel taxes to VMT fees. Having said that, there are many challenges to VMTs, including high implementation and operating costs, and public resistance, especially around privacy concerns related to GPS-enabled systems. Nevertheless, a recent National Commission on Surface Transportation Infrastructure Financing expressed strong concerns about the long-term viability of continuing to rely on fuel taxes, and in talking about the BMT option, said that, quote, there are few, if any, other viable options for meeting long-term highway and transit spending needs. I'll be happy to answer any questions that folks have about this. I know we're rolling into the Q&A time. I've also included some resources on this slide, or please feel free to get in touch with me at NCSL at any time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jamie. Seems like states are really becoming uh, more and more active in this area. Um, and with that, that actually concludes our three presentations. So I'd now like to open things up to the audience. Uh, if anyone had questions for the presenters, so operator, if you could uh, go over those instructions one more time. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. If you do have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. Questions will be taken in the order they were received. If at any time your question has been answered, you can move yourself from the queue by pressing 1. If you are using the speakerphone, we ask that while posing your question, you pick up your handset to provide favorable sound quality. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. Also, as a reminder, if you would like to submit a question via the web, you may use the chat box located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the send button. Please hold while we poll for questions. Oh, ben, this is Dennis. I've got one comment, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, sort of some feedback based on the comments of the other uh, presenters here. And, and some things were brought up that we, at the federal level, think are extremely critical that, uh, as far as being addressed uh, with some of the stakeholders at the state level. And, and the taxation is, is clearly one of them. Not only does it need to be... Uh, address for alternative fuel vehicles, but there's a lot of what you might think simple questions that are unanswered. I mean, the the state taxation is done in many cases differently, 50 different ways in all different states. In some cases, uh, you know, it, it's also in different departments, whether it's a weight and measures or a Department of Agriculture or something. One of the simple questions that isn't answered for some of these fuels is, what's a gallon? If you're trying to tax on a per gallon basis, well, that might make sense for gasoline or even ethanol that's a liquid fuel, but what about like compressed natural gas or what's a gallon of electricity? Uh, and some states have addressed that, but again, go across the border to the neighboring state and they're probably doing something completely different. So I think uh, to the extent that there's a, a coordination effort there, that, that would really be so helpful uh, and in many cases, whether it's a CMT approach or an annual tax stamp or fee. Uh, that may simplify greatly because just the measurement of some of these fuels becomes very complicated and, and the cost of the equipment to have a meter that would just track this on a per gallon basis runs the price of this uh, equipment up much more so than it would need to be if it could have been addressed in a simple fashion. Okay. Yeah, um, and may I respond to that as well? This is Jamie. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say, firstly, I want to thank you guys at the Department of Energy so much for being a national clearinghouse for a lot of the data about how states are addressing the taxation and incentives of alternative fuels. Even that one role, as you say, states are doing things very differently and how they're measuring energy content and gasoline gallon equivalents, all of that um, to have the resource like the National Alternative Fuels Data Center has really helped us and state stakeholders as well see what all the jurisdictions are doing right now in this interesting transitional time. Yeah, uh, yeah appreciate that. And I mean, some states, uh, I spoke recently at a group of state regulator, utility regulators, and some of them were under the impression, oh, well, well we've deregulated. Our, our state, you know, is deregulated as far as uh, electric and gasoline. But what they had deregulated was just the the, the fixed price, so to speak, and they really had not addressed the issues that 
Becky talked about as far as the sale for resale issue and the requirement that the only person, uh, the only entity in the state that could sell electricity is an electric utility, when in fact now we've got companies who, independent companies who want to sell that and natural gas and other fuels. Uh, so there's there's other uh, regulations that I think could be uh, or need to be addressed through this coordinating effort. And, and you want it to be consistent across the country, again, not just go uh, across the county line or uh, across the state line and have it done completely different. And the poor fleet guy who's got to roam all across the place every day with different rules all, you know, throughout his day he has to learn to comply with. Okay. Uh, I hate to break this up, but I do just want to – I know we have some questions in the queue, so I do just want to give those folks who have asked some questions a chance to, uh, you know, speak. So, Kara, if you could uh, – I believe we have one question on the phone waiting. Yes, we have one from Lucina Tillyhoff from the New Jersey office. Go ahead and state your question. Yeah, it's Lucinda Tajloff from the New Jersey Office of Legislative Services. Uh, I think it was Becky Harsh who was saying that uh, the utilities – don't seem to be particularly interested in owning uh, the stations for ref for fueling electricity, um, and you know I, I don't have a, a really a clear understanding of how the gasoline stations currently operate, but I am under the impression that they uh, somehow. Um, buy the gas that they sell to the people who come to fuel at their stations now um, or, you know, have some kind of arrangement with the gas, the, the gasoline um, manufacturers uh, to provide that gasoline. What are the obstacles to setting up that kind of a fueling system with electricity where the uh, utility would be providing the electricity into the fueling station and then an independent franchise would operate the uh, electrical fueling station very much like gasoline stations operate now. Um, no, that's a that's a great question, and actually, that is probably um, a better example of a model that um, that we've been looking at as utilities. Is you have third parties that are coming in and actually providing, and we're talking about largely in a public charging um, scenario. So you have a uh, third-party uh, electric vehicle service providers coming in and installing the charging stations and then working with the local utility to actually provide the fuel to those, um, those charging stations. So that okay. seems to be a much more uh, workable model. Um, and largely some of the issues that we have on the owning and operating side, it's largely being a regulated entity. Um, it kind of takes us out of that world and puts us more in a much more of a commercial perspective. And, and as a regulated utility, we don't have those uh, those types of capabilities. But there isn't necessarily a, a infrastructure problem with following the current gas station model for electrical f fueling. I I don't think so. I mean, and, and again, we're talking about a, a public charging scenario. Um, if a third-party provider wants to provide the, the charging stations and then work with their local utility to actually provide the fuel. And then states would need to figure out how they were going to deal with the difference in the regulatory entity, uh, excuse me, the how they are regulating the entity of a utility versus the That's gasoline manufacturers. Exactly, and, and that is one of the issues that, it, that we are addressing right now is you know, what is the status of these third-party providers to your uh, description of, you know, like the gas station model? Um, should they be treated as a regulated entity? And so far the, what we're seeing is that it, they're not being considered a regulated utility in large part um, because they're actually then purchasing the, the fuel at the retail level from the utility. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that does seem to be the trend that we're seeing right now. I see. But but we are of the mind that at some point there's got to be some level of oversight within those uh, electric vehicle service provider group um, to make sure that there are uh, consumer protections in place against you know price gouging and those types of things. So um, while they may not be considered a regulated utility, 
um, we are of the mind that there is going to have to be discussions about what type of oversight may be needed uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that, that consumers are protected in those situations. But then again, I think there's currently some kind of regulatory oversight model with gasoline that maybe could be translated in some way. That's a, that's a really good point, and that's a that's a place for us to start looking at uh, maybe a template for something we can build off of. Thank you. Great, great. Um, this is Ben Hush again. One uh, one question that actually came in over the web that I wanted to make sure uh, got out to our three uh, presenters actually deals with natural gas. I know we didn't talk uh, a lot about natural gas, but I mean, I guess given it's kind of the low price that uh, we are constantly reading about, uh, I did just want to bring up this question um, and whether or not natural gas vehicle technology um, you know, will become prevalent among non-fleet consumers or is it really just you know, better suited towards fleet use and if if it if it is available for non fleet use, what will be that tipping point for adoption? Yeah, I guess I'll uh, start out with that one. This is Dennis at Department of Energy. I mean, right now we feel like the primary users are going to be these big fleets and, and bigger trucks. Uh, the big, the biggest impediment to our challenge with natural gas vehicles is the cost of the infrastructure and the fueling stations. So. You know, it, it, the more fuel you use, the more cost-effective it's going to be for you. And right now, there's only one uh, original equipment manufacturer uh, of vehicles, the Honda Civic, that you can get in in natural gas. That would be more for a typical consumer. So, I think right now, uh, unless you're in a place like Southern California that's got a whole lot of uh, public infrastructure already, we see that the main uh, market for the, the consumer use of natural gas vehicles maybe to be coupled with uh, areas that have programs that have that use the home refueling appliance you know there's different just like you can have home recharging of electric vehicles you can have a home refueler if you've got natural gas in your home for cooking or water heating or other things so we really see the market being that right now uh, I think the tipping point uh, essentially is when more manufacturers are providing the vehicles and then you're seeing the expansion of the, uh, the, the refueling network, which will probably initially be for fleets, but then uh, as you get more and more fleets using them and you'll see more stations and they're willing to, to share the station. When I mentioned the $300 million earlier that we spent, uh, that inc included several thousand uh, natural gas refueling stations, and in, in most every case, we require that uh, they share the refueling, uh, you know, that it's not just private refueling. So, uh, not sure exactly the right number for what the tipping point would be, but I think uh, you're right. Initially, it's fleets. Uh, one day we see that as opening up some more, but it will be probably quite a bit out in the future. And I would agree with much of what Dennis said. I mean, some of our companies, um, we represent both uh, a lot of combination companies that have natural gas and um, electric um, service. And so I think, again, we're seeing that the largest piece of this right now on the natural gas side, it's a really good fit for the medium, heavy-duty, long-haul type of vehicles. Um, there are some existing fueling stations already in place for for that market, but we're just not seeing a huge push on the, the smaller passenger side um, vehicles. I think Dennis mentioned the Honda Civic is the only one currently out there. There's some conversion models. Um, I think uh, uh, GM, I think, had a conversion model to uh, for their trucks, some of their trucks, but um, right now we're focusing on home charging and home fueling. Um, and then as that develops and people get a sense of how to, how to best use those vehicles in that, in that charging and fueling technology, then we'll look at, you know, what other public opportunities there may be. But the cost is just too prohibitive right now. Yeah, I think if there's one thing we're trying to get the message across on all of these alternative fuels is there's really not any one of the options that's the best for every application. Some are very good applications for, for uh like she mentioned, the, ele the electric vehicle seem to be a good match for some of the uh, the, the consumer-based uh, market, the sm smaller vehicles. But you're not going to see 18-wheeler tractor-trailers that are pure electric 
vehicles uh, anytime soon. Yet that may be a great application for some of the liquefied natural gas or something. So that's why we're thinking this uh, all of the above approach. You know, try to match the best uh, fuels uh, in these alternatives with the best applications where they make sense, where they're cost effective, where uh, you know people can really reap the, the appropriate benefits. And I think a lot of them do match up that way, uh, but everyone's not perfect for every application. Jamie, one question uh, we got uh, from the web, which I, I think uh, is, is best addressed to you, uh, regards some of the privacy concerns uh, regarding VMT, uh, and I didn't know if you could speak to that um, and how those concerns uh, were addressed in, say, the Oregon studies or some of the other states. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that briefly. Um, first, I want to say that some VMT systems that have been proposed don't really raise the same kind of privacy concerns because they would be based on annual odometer readings or something like that. But some of them would have variable fees that depend on where and when people travel um, using something like GPS tracking, uh, which means that citizens have very real concerns about the government knowing where and when they are at certain times. And states have responded to this. Um, in 2009, for example, the Missouri legislature considered but didn't enact a bill that would have prohibited the use of GPS or other location tracking technology to monitor travel for the purpose of a VMT type of fee. Um, so, you know, existing proposals and pilot projects, and, and there's a lot of data on all of these, have taken steps to ensure the privacy and security of travel data. And technical approaches have certainly been demonstrated um, but even so, if the systems aren't well designed, privacy could, in reality, be at risk. Um, and, and there's another piece to that, too. So not only do the, does privacy need to be safeguarded, but the public needs to be convinced that the safeguards exist and are effective. Um, and Oregon is an interesting issue because it's the best known BMT pilot project. Um, and they're actually starting another phase of their pilot project, I believe this autumn, um, which in part deals with the privacy concerns, um, which was one of the main critiques um, of the first time around. Um, and this time they are just having a small group of stakeholders participate in the second pilot project, um, but this time the project will allow participants to choose how they report miles driven and how they pay their bill. Um, whereas before there was just kind of one option for that. So choices this time include a non-technology option and also opting out for a flat annual tax that can sidestep reporting altogether. Um, so this would be really interesting to see what Oregon does in its new test this year. Um, it's also dealing with some of other concerns and critiques that were raised with its kind of first big well-known pilot project. Um, I'll just mention that people were also concerned that there would have to be a large new government bureaucracy to deal with this whole new system. And so this time around, they're experimenting with outsourcing a lot of what they're doing to the private sector. Um, so in short, I would say, you know, there's a lot of technological solutions to this privacy issue, um, but also there are kind of non-technology and opt-out solutions that are being considered as well. All right, well, thank you. Um, and at this time, it actually appears that we have no more questions in the queue, so that today uh, concludes today's webinar on alternative fuels and vehicles. I would like to once again thank Dennis Smith of the Department of Energy, Becky Harsh of the Edison Electric Institute, and Jamie Rawl of the National Conference of State Legislatures for uh, presenting today and uh, going over some really important topics and providing some really helpful information. For those that joined late uh, or for those that would like to listen again, I will be posting a replay of today's webinar online later this week. Uh, and for those that would like a copy of the slides, I got a few messages requesting those. Uh, please, uh, if you could just shoot me an email uh, at ben.husch at ncsl.org, uh, and I can get you a copy of the slides used today. Uh, additionally, uh, 
or really anyone on the call um, that have not already done so, I would highly, highly encourage you to register for NCSL's upcoming 2012 Legislative Summit, uh, August 6th through 9th in Chicago, Illinois, uh, where the transportation that both Jamie and I staff will be meeting uh, to update its entire set of policies. Uh, and one other policy that will also be updated is uh, the energy security policy, which is actually in the agriculture and energy policy. but. Uh, Given that I believe a number of our presenters mentioned that as a theme today, I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, so again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Have a great uh, rest of the day. And for uh, those on the East Coast, I would say stay cool as I believe it's now uh, over 100 degrees outside. So thanks again, and uh, I will speak to everyone later. Thank you.